Hiya, John. So we've gone live. Um, so the last, last couple of weeks, John, since you've built up your channel, a lot of people have said to me, there's a guy um, got his own channel and he's talked about a lot of the characters that you've been speaking to and, and should I speak to you? Um, yeah. So your channel, congratulations, has got quite a bit of interest and it's, it's grown quite quickly in such a short space of time. What's made you do the channel, John? Well, I was asked to do a series of interviews by Sam, you know, his uh, podcast, uh, Real Porridge. Yeah. And uh, they seem to be quite successful. He attracted a number of uh, viewers for that. So I thought, well, it might be that this is something that people want to hear about. And there's a real message, you know, that prison, certainly the yeah. prisons that I worked in, not only do they not work, they have an opposite effect. They make people angry. They made people revengeful. And the, the level of recidivism in the 1970s and 80s was way over 80%. Yeah. I, and I, I believe people need to know, you know, when they say, oh, he should be banged up. Well, this is what happens when you get banged up. And I'm just telling them what happened when I was there banging them up at strange ways. Yeah, it's a, it's a scary statistic, you know, the, the offenders and a lot of them. Um, so where are you from, John? Where, was you, where, you, where were you brought up? I was actually born in a place called Folridge, which is near Colne, on the, on the Lancashire-Yorkshire border. But my dad was a police officer. And uh, we moved around Lancashire, and uh, I was, uh, in my early years, I lived at Presswich, which was a, a really nice area. Next door was the bank manager, opposite was the guy who had the Ford franchise. They were all Jew boys. It was a Jewish area of Presswich. And uh, I lived there till I was nearly nine years of age, and then we moved to a place called Lee, which is... Uh, an industrial town in the north of England, next door to Wigan. And when we moved to Lee, I simply could not understand what the children were saying to me because they were speaking what to me was a foreign language. They were saying things like, now then, lad, what da doing? What do it need? And seriously, I, I'm not, I wasn't being snooty. I just didn't understand it. And of course, because I couldn't understand their language, they thought I was being somewhat supercilious. And we started fighting because I went on to my dad. I thought, well, it was me and my brother were getting beat up by these kids. So I thought, well, there's no problem. I'll tell my dad and see, he'll sort it out, you know, because he's a big fella. And you know what he said? He said, listen, he said, you've got to go back in there and stand up for yourself. And I'd, I'd been brought up. In, in a rather refined area of Manchester where people spoke very nicely and they all had cars, and this is in the 1950s. So I had to go back to school with my younger brother and uh, face the bullies. who were. And we started with the biggest, and I worked my way through all the lot until everybody left me alone. And from that stage on, throughout my life, I've been involved in, in through no wish of my own in physical violence, believe it or not. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so what made you, what made you kind of, how did you fall into the, the British prison system? Albeit you never went to prison yourself. What made you, I mean, so where was your career when you left school? Well, I had a rather strange career. I worked in the, in the cotton mills, believe it or not. The, what was left of the cotton mills in Lancashire, I worked in that. And I got the idea that this was going nowhere, so I decided to join the British Army. And I joined the Army in 1968, and uh, I went and did my basic training at Oswestry with the Royal Artillery. And from there, I was transferred to the Parachute Regiment at uh, Aldershot. And I was with the Parachute Regiment for a while, but I got in a, a great deal of lumber there. And they, they booted me out and sent me to Germany. And I was in Germany with the Royal Artillery. And uh, there, 
I very quickly progressed and uh, I became an NCO within two years and uh, was teaching the other soldiers how to use the Honest John missile. Also became the uh, regimental and divisional middleweight boxing champion. All right. And uh, I, I represented the regiment and, and the brigade at, uh, at, at uh, BAOR in, in the Boxing Association of the British Army. Uh, so I was quite good at that. Mm. And uh, so I had always been used to a bit, a bit of a rough and tumble, you know. Mm. I stayed in the Army for five years. I came out as a non-commissioned officer and uh, had to decide what I was going to do with my life. So I saw an advertisement, believe this or not, it was 1974, and there was an advertisement in the Daily Mirror, and it, and it was a picture of a man with a uniformed hat on, and it said, they call this man a thug. And for a joke, my wife said, hey, you, they've got a job for you here. <laughs> I'm not a thug, you know. But uh, she said, why don't you have a look at that? So I applied to join the prison service and uh, went for the exams. It was straightforward, really, to me. It was fairly straightforward. Mm. Uh, I had the medical at, uh, at Strangeways Prison at, on South Hall Street. And, so you, uh, you started you started Strangeways Prison. Was it in 1975 you started, John? <clears throat> January 1975, yeah. Right. Can I just ask, John, was Strangeways the only prison you worked in or was there many others? No, I've been around a lot of prisons. I worked at... Uh, Wormwood Scrubs. When I'd completed my training, I started at Strangeways, but it was national recruitment at the time. It wasn't local recruitment. You know, they did not recruit staff at Manchester to work at Manchester. It mm. was one, one of the national hubs. So they had national recruiting and a national training school, two actually, one at Wakefield and one at a prison called Lay Hill near Bristol. And I was sent to Lay Hill. And following uh, the, the training at Lay Hill, I was posted to Wormwood Scrubs in London. Right. Um, <clears throat> but back then in the 70s, prison, I mean, what, you're talking 50 years now. <laughs> um, pr 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 prison life then was very different today. And I think the Strange Ways riots in November 1990 kind of changed a lot for, for the good of the prisoners. Um how different, I mean, obviously it, it was the slopping out, it was a lot of, you know, one shower a week, uh, I can't imagine it, but did you, I mean, was it was it a hard, I mean, you know, the prisoners lived there, but was it hard to work in an environment like that, John? Well, I'd been used to the army. I mean, the army was tough. I mean, I was in Libya in 1969, in the middle of the Sahara Desert, facing off the uh, the revolutionary army of Colonel Gaddafi. So compared to that, Wormwood Scrubs was a tea party. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, when you worked in Wormwood Scrubs, did you come across, obviously we're going to talk a little bit about some of the people yeah. you met and I'm quite familiar with from writing books, but Wormwood Scrubs, I mean, did you come across, I mean, the Crays were in there, the, the Richardsons, Roy Shaw, any of these kind of names that you ever come across? Well, the train robbers were in there, Gordon Goody and, uh, and that lot, and uh, Tony Lambriano was uh, on D-Wing. There was a number of uh, big-name villains in there. I mean, but these big-name villains, you just left them alone. You know, they tended to be low profile, but a lot, a lot of privileges for them on D-Wing. But if you were on E-Wing, at C-Wing where I worked at the Scrubs, that was just uh, generally uh, a routine prison. But we still got a number of names on. We had uh, one that I distinctly remember was uh, the Cambridge Rapist. I don't know if you, you were familiar with that case, but he used to wear a, a leather mask with a zip, and he was on all the papers. He was raping students in Cambridge. And uh, he'd done a, probably about 15 or 20 of these, a lot of people he'd raped. And, uh, he was on C2 landing at uh, Wormwood Scrub, uh, but with the Scrubs, yeah. And uh, I was in charge of the, the, uh, the landing where he was. 
And one day I opened the cell and uh, out came this guy. His name, his real name was Peter Cook. But he was known as the Cambridge Rapist. And he came out and he'd made a dress from his bed. He got some paint and painted it like a dress. And he had this uh, makeup dress on, no clothes underneath. All he got was this dress on and an enormous great erection. And he tried to grab hold of me. Kiss me, Mr. Sutton. Kiss me, are you? Boof. Mm. Helped him back into his cell very gently, you know. Mm. But the, the Cambridge rapist, yeah, what a dangerous bastard he was. So was it? Was he in a normal prison population? He was, category, he was category A, but he was on C2 landing, yeah. Right, okay. Was there any of the more notable names that you remember, John, from that time in Wormwood Scrubs? Well, was Ian Brady, the uh, the Moors murderer? He was on uh, the segregation unit when I was there. They tried to relocate Brady onto D Wing, which was normal location D Wing, for, for the lifers, you know. But the, somebody had snatched him, dragged him into a recess, and uh, gave him a boiling water shower. He didn't like that, you know. Mm. So they transferred him back to the segregation unit. How, and, how, uh, how different were um, the southern prisons, like you were with scrubs, scrubs compared to the, the northern England ones, like your strange ways? Is there a big difference, or is it? Well, a lot of the inmates at uh, the scrubs were professional criminals, and that they used to call you gov or boss, you know. Mm. And... Uh, there was racism there. And listen, it wasn't, I'm not racist. I don't care. I really don't. But there were a lot of West Indians there who, who were racist. And they used to call you things like uh, Bamba Clat and uh, Rash Clat. To this day, I still don't know what it means. But it was some kind of uh, insult supposed to uh, make me feel angry. I just thought it was stupid. <laughs> And um, obviously, you were very familiar with um, a certain Mr. Paul Sykes. Um, can I just ask, John, how old are you, if mummy asking? I'm 72. Uh, Sykes was born in 46, so you would have been coming up. A bit older than me, yeah. Yeah. Um, before you met him, John, did you hear of the reputation? Because inside prison, he was kind of... Like a god, he he was like kind of royalty. He was this Mister D. Paul Sykes? Mm. Uh, what before you met him? What was the kind of things that you'd heard of him? <clears throat> yeah, I'd seen him on TV boxing uh, John L. Gardner. So that was seventy nine. So yeah. right, okay. July, I think it was seventy nine. Yeah, June June seventy nine. It was I'm back end of June. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you'd seen him. I mean, yeah. I take it a lot. I mean, I spoke to John L. Gardner. And uh, he told me a lot of the prison officers used to wind Paul Sykes up and and um, shout things about, you know, you cowardly bastard tearing your back and all this. And the prison guards in the 80s never let him forget it. Um, you know, because to be honest, his boxing career, certainly in Britain, was finished after that. He, he, he wasn't, he was ridiculed. It was, it was, um, he, he did the worst thing ever of turning his back and quitting. And he, he, he never lived it down, but um, so because he he's a bully, you see. He was yeah, a bully. Typ typical bully who obviously turned his back, couldn't take um, it. And I but, saw the fight, and John L. Gardner gave him a proper boxing lesson. Yeah, <clears throat> didn't I mean, I've watched that fight many, many times, hmm. and for the first three rounds, it's 50 50, but then the next three, John just takes them apart. And Paul Sykes didn't know how to what what to do. Um, I spoke to some of his trainers, and they said, "Well, he didn't expect because John L. Gardner had been on the floor against um, a light puncher one or two fights before Sykes. When Gardner was still there in the fourth, Sykes mm -hmm. didn't have a clue what to do. And um, you're very right; the bully ran out of ideas. He was a typical bully, and when someone mm -hmm. stands up to a bully, mm -hmm. they quit or they turn the back. Quit. But um, what, what kind of things had you heard? So you'd seen him on television, um, and mm. when you met him, what so what year was it when you met him? 
I think it was about 81, 82. That's right. right. He was in Strange Ways, 81, mm. 82. Yeah, well, I was in Strange Ways, and I was a hospital officer at the time, mm. and he'd kicked up, and uh, they'd, hold, they'd held him down, and I was instructed by the senior medical officer to forcibly inject him with uh, um, a, a, a psychotropic drug, you know, like... Lagactyl. Lagactyl. Up or out of, in the in the backside, you know, mm. and after that, put him in a cell and uh, leave him for a couple of days. And seriously, he was never the same after that. Mm. A sh shambling wreck, you know. So, I mean, I have heard a lot of that, and I've spoken to a few prison governors. Um, one in particular, Phil Wheatley from Hull. Do you remember him? I can't say I do. To be honest. Um. So I've spoke, and a lot of people said we give Sykes double doses just to sedate him. That's right. And um, we, we we dug some footage out which had never been seen. Um, I think it's on my channel. It's called the Lost Paul Sykes interview or something. And you can tell he's been interviewed on his bed and he's he's sedated. He's really docile. And, and that was um, mm. a lot of the prison officers I've spoken to said, that's how we used to deal with him. That's it. Well, I was the hospital officer that used to give him the medication, and we always used to say, <clears throat> 10 mils and a cough. You know, <clears throat> you know, so he gets like a double dose of the Largactyl, because you take it liquidly, yeah? Mm. But, but to start with, because he was kicking up, he got it in the, ja in the jaxi with, with, with a needle. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, what one prisoner Paul Sykes was very close with, was Mad Frankie Fraser. And I think they actually met in strange ways. Was that the same time you were there, John? Yeah. Frankie Fraser was a little shit house, you know? I mean, you could pick him up with one hand. I could have picked him up with one hand and thrown him over the landing, you know? Mm. He, he was nothing much to him. But that's not how Frankie Fraser operated. He attacked from behind. You know, if you turned your back on him, he'd hit you from behind. And uh, that was his modus operandi. And uh, when he was working with the Richardsons, they had the heavies hold men down and they used to nail them <coughs> to the wooden floors in the warehouses. And Frankie Fraser would rip the teeth out and burn them with a blowtorch. Mm. He was an evil little bastard, but on his own, he couldn't stand it. But listen, he must have been a tough bastard because he was whipped. Twice, you know, nine tails, nine tails twice. Now, I know he did that because I was the officer in charge of the records department at Strange Ways. And when Frankie Fraser came in, I think it was 79, 80, well, 81, something like that. Yeah. At the time, before I became a hospital officer, I saw his records and I went through them one lunchtime and he'd been he'd been flogged twice. And he'd been put on bread and water numerous times. I mean, bread and water that was a sentence that could be handed down to a prisoner by the governor for uh, misbehaviour, yeah? And Frankie Fraser had got that a couple of times. Yeah. Um, I think, well, Frankie died um, kicking on for 90, but he'd, I think he'd spent, he'd actually spent <laughs> something like, 42 years of his life behind the door, which is unbelievable. Yeah, what a wonderful life he had, and probably well-deserved as well, because during World War II, Frankie Fraser was a burglar. So yeah. people, people are away fighting uh, the Germans and the Nazis, and they got the, the blackout in London. Ideal for Frankie Fraser, he went and robbed the Romes. And he ended, he ended up getting in prison for that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, one of his favourite sayings was, I never forgive Hitler for surrendering, I think it was 46, because uh, the East End, it wasn't the East End, London, it was like South London, was a thief's paradise. Well, that's what he was, a petty thief. But mm. then then he started to decide he was going to mutilate people. And he, he used an axe on people and mm -hmm. pliers to rip the teeth out and knives and guns. He was a completely, without any remorse, I would say he was a pure psychopath. Yeah. You know, he, um, he had, I met him 
strange ways, and this is no joke, at strange ways, it was lunchtime. Now, it was about, I would say, half past, half past 12, 25 to 1. And I saw this man moving on the landing. I was in charge of air wing at that time. So I saw him moving on the landing. I, said, I went down. I said, Fraser, get back in your cell. Oh, no, he said, it's all right. The chief officer says I, I can be out. I, I don't have to be locked up. I said, I'm going to tell you one more time. Get behind your door and shut it. So he said, I'll go in my door. He said, but you're being paid to shut the door, not me. And he went in. He gave me one of those, what I'd call a really old-fashioned type of look, you know, like, who the hell do you think you are? But I looked him up, and I went to see the chief officer. I said, what's this about Fraser being out at lunchtime? Oh, he said, it's only Frankie. I said, that is a dangerous psychopath. And when I'm on the landing, he's locked up. So I, I put the chief officer right about that. I mean, you couldn't have that man. He's walking around. He could come behind you. He blinded one officer at, at Durham. He hit him with a yeah, chair. Right. It, it, it fractured his uh, uh, optic nerve, blinded him. Yeah. A dangerous little bastard. Mm -hmm. But only little. Um, so regarding Paul Sykes, um, John, what was his conduct inside prison? And obviously he was a lot doped up. Um, I've spoken, uh, listen, I know what the man was, um, listen, the guy was an animal, uh, you know, had a certain lot of bad, a lot of good traits, a lot of people have told me you knew him, I didn't know him, but, um, <clears throat> I'm just reporting on some of the facts and, and I, and I've spoken to the top chief of Wakefield police and I've spoken to lots, so many different people, many, many different mixed emotions, mm. many different uh, opinions of him. What was your personal opinion of him, John? Because you knew him, you were there, you were around him. Yeah, I thought he was an abuser. I thought he was uh, taking advantage of young inmates, young young male prisoners. I mean, don't forget, Sykes was what six foot four, sixteen stone, six foot three and a half. Well, he's got it. Yeah, he's, he's a big lad. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he, uh, I, I, I'm not saying I have no evidence that he raped. Yeah, male inmates, but I know that he was uh, associating himself with young inmates and he was abusing them, using them as slaves. And one of his friends at the time was a man called Delroy Showers. Yeah, I've met him several times. Now, I had dealings with Delroy Showers. I don't know if you're familiar with the 1953 Prison Act, probably not. But it stipulates in the 1953 Prison Act that a young prisoner under the age of 21 may not associate with male adult prisoners. Yeah? They've got to be segregated. And in strange ways, in 1981-82, they had a, <clears throat> a section of a wing dedicated to young prisoners. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And I was, oh, I was on that wing. I think it was... Uh, I think it was... E2 landing, yeah, was being used for this at the time. And they partitioned it off, you know. And I was on there and I saw Delroy Showers and he was a, he'd was he been made a red band, you know, mm -hmm. to clean the landings. And now I knew that Delroy Showers was about 32 at the time, something like uh, this. Let me think. So he was born, Sykes was 46, Delroy was... 51. So he was, uh, Delroy's 71, 72 now. Yeah. So he's So he was about 32. Yeah. 30. Yeah. 31. Anyway, so I said, I knew that he was not a, a young prisoner. So I said to, uh, as, as soon as I saw him, I said, right, get your gear pack, you. You're not on here. Oh, no. He said, I'm, uh, I'm the wing, I'm the landing cleaner, the wing cleaner, you know. I said, no, you're not. This is the U this is the YP unit. Now pack your gear. You're moving. So I made him pack all his gear up into a, you know, the used pillowcases, you know. Mm -hmm. And I took him. And as I was taking him off the wing, the, the principal officer who was in charge of that unit came out and said, what do you think you're doing? I said, I'm relocating him. Oh, no, I said, that's my cleaner. I said, uh, you are aware that this man is an adult. And this is a YP wing. He said, well, I am in charge of it. 
I said, you won't be in charge of it much longer if you do this. I said, because I'll report you. I said, and if they don't deal with it in the chief's office, they will certainly deal with it at the police station because my brother's the detective inspector there. Mm. That was the end of that. And I relocated uh, Delroy Showers back into the main wing. He, he was um, a low, short guy, five foot five, I think. <clears throat> Not a bit of fat on him. Very formidable in character. I mean, to be honest, John, I've met a lot of people in the last couple of years but Delroy is probably by far the most interesting. Um, it's like meeting Chris Eubank. He's so eloquently spoken, mm. highly intelligent. Um, <clears throat> you know, if he'd never, if he'd never chosen the criminal of the a path as a professional criminal, Absolutely. the guy could have done anything. Uh, I'm, I'm writing his book, his brother's book at the minute. Uh, Michael Showers. Did you ever come across Michael? I never met Michael Showers, no. I know he's done plenty of time in Denmark, isn't it? Michael's, um, so the courts have given him 46 years. Uh, sorry, <laughs> 46 years, and he's, actu he's actually done 26 years behind the door. Is that a way to spend your life? Yeah, it's staggering, isn't it? Um, <clears throat> and, and regarding Paul Sykes, I mean, listen, I, I've been in prison I've, I've been to inter interview his son um, in a, um, a prison called Dovegate, I think it was. Don't know and, and he said, listen, if our dad was here now, he used to he would openly admit that he would sleep with men. <clears throat> but Ray, <laughs> I mean, I've I've spoken to the top chief of Wake, uh, West Yorkshire Police. Yeah. And they said, listen, we hated that man. Um, I've interviewed, I've, I've arrested him when he was in his pram and that he would take half the shift from, from Wood Street, Nick. And I've, and I've, <clears throat> I've arrested him when, when he was an old frail man and a gush of wind would have blew him over. He said, Sykes never had any convictions whatsoever for any kind of a sexual nature. And it, mm. his, um, mm. his criminal record was, Astonishing. It was huge. Um, it was and, and he said, listen, I've got no reason to lie. The guy never had any convictions of a sexual nature. That's just a fact, John. But obviously, um, <laughs> listen, I think it's well known. Paul Sykes used to call it gay for the stay. And he, he, he was, um, he, he would often indulge in homosexual activities. But for actual rape, dragging people in cells in there. I've Don't just, listen, I'm, I'm not defending the guy. I've just not come across any factual evidence. What's your opinion, John? I never heard that he raped anybody, but he certainly abused them. Oh, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> yeah, <throat> listen, I, I would agree with that. Did he manipulate people? Did he, um, you know, I mean, listen, Paul Sykes was a god in prison, so there was a lot of young well, let me tell you, not at, Strangeways, not at Strangeways he wasn't, because by right. that time, by that time he'd started to fade a little bit. And what year was this in? Eighty-one, eighty-two. Eighty-one, eighty-two. He'd started to fade a little, and he'd been. I mean, so John, are you aware of that documentary? <clears throat> so that documentary was released December the fourth, nineteen ninety, and it was filmed in eighty-eight, eighty-nine. So Sykes well, was 42, 43, 44 then. He was yeah. still a hell of a formidable monster of a man. Um, it, I mean, in some ways, he was doped up. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, the, but, the, you know, the real mm -hmm. decline on Paul Sykes happened around mm -hmm. the millennium. Um, <clears throat> you know, and it was almost like Cinderella at midnight. <clears throat> it, his parents mm -hmm. died within the space of 12 weeks, and then his wife left him. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then he, and then he, you've seen the pictures. He's got eight courts on. He's got the jazz hands, um, you know. But what, John? Listen, you lived the life I didn't. What was the overall opinion of you and your colleagues of Sykes? Was it, was he? Could you warm to him, or was he just an out and out bad bastard? No, he was. He had a sense of humour, didn't he? Yeah. I mean, and and you could have a little bit of a laugh with him. <clears throat> but once he'd managed to get on the wrong side of the staff, 
and get himself doped up, then he was unintelligible like all the rest. I mean, they walk around in a trance. Have you seen people who are doped up on Largactyl? Mm -hmm. That's what he was like. So he wasn't, yeah. a, he wasn't running anything at strange ways. Mm -hmm. you know? um, I mean, one, one guy who was in there at the same time, uh, I interviewed him a couple of years back called, um, uh, he was part of the Strange Ways riots. Um, oh Lord! Is he a black guy, quite muscular? Yeah, he does a yeah, lot. Of I mean, he was in there when Paul Sykes was in, albeit a, a young lad. Um, Alan, his name was Alan Lord. Alan Lord, that's it. Yeah. Um, I mean, was I mean, um, did you have any personal dealings with Sykes? Was there any kind of issues when you seen him attack people? He never attacked anybody when I was there. When I the first time I met him, he was being held down on the floor, and I injected him. That was it. And then he was uh, in the cells and quiet because you, once you've got that in you, then you're quiet. And from that point on, Paul Sykes was a shambling, uh, largactal zombie. That was him. Yeah. There was a guy at, 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 in strange ways that you may know of, and uh, his name was George Wilkinson. He was bigger than Paul Sykes. He was probably about six foot seven, six foot eight, an absolute giant of a man. And he was down the segregation unit on D1 in the block. And he was refusing to take food or water or anything. And uh, he was a, he'd been terrorizing this village in Cumbria, I believe it was. Uh, and uh, he was a real big, dangerous bastard, but not in strange ways. You see, in strange ways, they had somebody called the school bully. And uh, they also had uh, a guy called uh, the Chinese Money Box. They had the Black Dog. They had Piggy. These were the team that ran D1, you know. Mm. And if you went in there and you thought you were going to run strange ways, that's who you encountered. Mm -hmm. And when you got down the block, all ideas of running strange ways vanished. All these people who go on television and say, I was too tough for strange ways. Well, I never saw. Yeah, well, the... Do you know something? Ian, Ian Brown put in his book that he was a bit of a lad in all this. And um, I, I come across a screw years ago um, who worked in street. I forgot his name. And uh, he said he said he wouldn't come out of his cell. But obviously, in Ian Brown's book, it was a very different story. Um, <clears throat> did you ever come across the Noonans, John? No, I, I know who you mean. I've seen Noonan talking about his activities. He was what I'd call a plastic gangster who thought he could run parts of Manchester like the craze did in the East End of London. But in strange ways, from what I remember of, of Noonan, uh, he, he thought he was something of a, of a heavy, but no, he wasn't. I think he was down the block. But I don't particularly remember. It doesn't stick in my mind. One that does stick in my mind is a guy called Nielsen, who was also known as the Black Panther. Have you seen him? You know him? Yes, yeah, yeah. He was in strange ways. Now, I was a hospital officer, and, I, and he was on some form of medication. So 7 o'clock in the morning, I'd go around, take his medication, and he'd be doing step-ups and sit-ups and press-ups and running on the spot. And that's what floats your boat. Get on with it. But then again, at, at five, 4 o'clock at night, when I went around with the evening medication, or the, the late, you'd still be doing the same thing all day, consistently. All day, stop. I'm sure. mad. Can I ask? So, with you, with you around so many um, despicable monsters, was it was it an effect on you mental health when you got home and you went to bed or you were having your tea? Was it hard to switch off when you've been around literally the worst kind of people society offered, or was it just something that you just become used to? Uh, my opinion is these are human beings who've gone wrong. And uh, if they're mentally ill, then they need treatment. They don't need thrashing around the floor or kicking 
that they got at Strangeways, they need to be psychiatrically dealt with. You know, people like uh, the Black Panther and uh, what was his name, the uh, Cambridge Rapist, they're insane. Mm -hmm. You know, people who are committing crimes like uh, Paul Sykes, it's a bad bastard. He needs to be contained, but he doesn't need to be abused, you know? He needs to be contained. That's what the prisons are all about. I mean, I'll tell you something. At Strange Ways, I mean, you've talked about uh, what, what the attitude of the sin was. At Strange Ways, the staff, a lot of the staff were in something called the National Front, as you've heard of the National Front. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the leader of the Northwest National Front was a principal officer at Strange Ways. And uh, he mistook me for a fellow traveller and invited me to go to a meeting of the National Front with him. And it just so happened that uh, the deputy leader of the Labour Party, Eric Heffer, who was a, a Labour MP for Liverpool, contacted me and asked me, would I submit a report on the National Front in the prison service? Because he knew I was politically active, you know. Mm. So I went along with this principal officer to the meeting of the National Front, and it was addressed by a man from America called David Dukes. Do you know who David Dukes is? No. Well, David Dukes was the Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. And he was giving a lecture on racism and the, and the purity of the white race to the National Front Movement in Manchester, which was led by a principal officer at Strange Ways Jail. Mm. And I wrote this up and I sent it to Eric Heffer and I sent it to uh, the Jewish Gazette. <laughs> And I also had uh, articles published in the press. I've got one here, actually. Uh, it, I don't know if you can see it. That's the Daily Star. Yes, so that's the front page. Front page. It says on I mean, the front. John, so obviously I'm right in saying that there was pro-Nazi, like real racists doing a yeah. job for yeah. the government. So a lot did that personal evil sinister personality leak out towards the prisoners. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it was hidden, but not hidden very well because the members of the National Front used to wear a like a pin, a, a, a little on their on their lapels. It was like a furled Union Jack, the National Front symbol. Yeah. And the government must have known about this because I got this principal officer and I got his photograph in the press. I got it in the press. They went absolutely spare in the jails. All the, all the articles I got in the press, they, they banned the papers from the prisons across the UK. I wrote a big feature for the Guardian, banned across the UK. I got. I was in. I was in the Guardian many times. What did it say? Oh, it said uh, that this man is not an ogre. Do you know what they did? The POA and the government told everybody I was an agent of Colonel Gaddafi, and that I was being funded by Libya to cause chaos in the British prison system because I tried to start a trade union for prison officers of basic rank. Because you can't tell me that a chief officer who was in charge of management and a basic great prison officer can be in the same trade union because they're diametrically opposed. One is trying to tell the other to do a job that's totally unacceptable, locking three male adults into a cell that's 12 foot by 8 foot, designed in the reign of Queen Victoria for one man. Yeah? yeah. And here we are in the 1970s, 1980s, banging three adults in there. No sanitation. Yeah. Disgraceful. Yeah. I said, I said, yeah, this is, we can't do this. Let's stop it. And that all changed, didn't it, kind of after the Strange Ways riots? It was all two years ago. It was in 1990. It was always going to happen, the yeah. Strange Ways riot. I mean, I'm in the I'm on record in the paper here saying we're sick of the Victorian dungeons and yeah. the 
the lid is coming off. I'll tell you something. It's, it, maybe most people won't know this. The people that were convicted, that were stood trial in Manchester at the Crown Court, in, I think it was Minchell Street, I don't know, maybe Manchester Crown Court, yeah? Uh, their solicitor asked me to speak for the defence. So I really? gave, I gave evidence against the government at Manchester Crown Court in favour of the rioters at Strange Ways. And I said, quite clearly, if I had been subjected to these disgusting <laughs> conditions, then I too would have taken the roof off. Because there's only one way this monster was going to be stopped, and that's by rioting. And John, the, the John can I just say, yeah. so at the minute I'm writing a book on Jack the Ripper, and um, <clears throat> what them five murders done in ten weeks was kind of make the unbearable poverty on the streets of Whitechapel better. So, kind of, yes, five women were butchered, never caught, but it did turn, it did turn uh, East End life for the better. And I think the mm. Strange Ways riots, yes, it, it was yeah. ho horrible and cost millions and that. And, but I think that was when, <clears throat> because you lit you're literally talking about Victorian dungeons, you're talking about yeah. a prison system 100 years behind. And that's the way it was run. It was run like the 1940s. Mm. And the staff, they didn't converse with the inmates. I mean, I believe that the inmates should be treated as human beings. I used yeah. to have a, have a joke with them, you know, and say, listen, you're in here for six months. It'll be gone like that. You'll forget all about it. You get on with your life. Don't come back and, and have a joke with them. But a lot of the staff thought, I don't know what the hell they thought. They were Nazis. They used to slash the peaks of their hats and, and stamp up and down in hobnail boots. And, <laughs> they were playing a game. I mean, this is people's lives. Yeah. You can't treat people like that. But yeah. it wasn't very popular with the other staff, I'm telling you. I ended up getting assaulted by staff on numerous occasions and finally was medically discharged. The Home Office sent me to see a psychiatrist, you know, because they said anybody who behaves like this must be mad. The psychiatrist said, he'd spoke to me for about two or three hours, and he said, I have concluded, Mr. Sutton, said that you're perfectly sane, but where you're working is absolutely mad. <laughs> so they were certified mad, and I was uh, sane. But I was John, never... You've got a couple of questions here. <clears throat> so, did you ever meet a huge black fella called Tony Brown from Leeds back in the day? I can't remember. I don't remember meeting a man like that. No, I don't remember. Um, another question. Did Paul Sykes attack lots of screws? I think you've answered that, haven't you? He was too sedated. He was doped up. He, he did try it on, but he ended up on the floor with a needle in his backside. I yeah. know. I... Um, <clears throat> so on the subject of Paul Sykes, I think you were in Strange Ways, was it till 85? 85, yeah. <clears throat> so obviously you'd come across him. What did you think? That, did you watch the documentary in December 1990 of Paul Sykes then? I have, I have seen a bit of things about Paul Sykes, and it strikes me that he's uh, out of touch with reality. I mean, yeah. talk, you heard how he was speaking to his children, you know. Mm. Well, I mean, all that, you're going to get a real good idea here, not one of these chaps. I mean, look what good it did. Yeah. Both his sons are in prison now, serving life. John, John Paul, Paul Sykes was in so many different prisons and he had so many tests. And um, <clears throat> remarkably, the comeback that he was, he wasn't mad. Um, oh, so he was bad. In your opinion, do you, th I mean, obviously, technology's advanced now. Um, I mean, I've spoken to people who said, listen, he had ADA, uh, ADHD or something like that. What was your, do you think he was normal? Just what was your opinion of him? I think he was a sociopath. Yeah. I think he was a sociopath with psychopathic. Narcissistic sociopath. Yeah. Sociopath. I mean, he had no empathy with people that he was hurting. No, absolutely not. He, um, he did. I spoke to one close friend years ago. Uh, he's mentioned in um, 
the Paul Sykes book. I won't name him. He's got. He's gone now. But um, he said, "See the Paul Sykes who's crying when he beat um, the American boxer and he puts him in hospital." He said, "I didn't know that, Paul." He said, "Because when Paul Sykes hurt people, he didn't care. He didn't have any ounce of empathy." Uh, no. And that was. I think that's pretty much um, bang on to my research, John. What you actually your feedback on Mr. Sykes was? That's what I feel anyway. So I had a look last night, John. You've actually got a book out. I've got a number of books. I am an international best-selling author. I say so myself. Wow. I was published by Harper Collins in '92. I was published by Bloomsbury in '97, and my best-selling book is called Psychic Pets. Right. So, so how many in total have you got, John? Yeah, I think it was eleven books altogether. Wow, right, okay. Uh, can people buy it? Where can people buy these? On, on Amazon. Look up John G. Sutton on Amazon. Psychic and Screw. Then, I take it the books are all about the, the British prison penal system? No, a lot of my books are about psychic matters because I've been working for many years as a professional psychic and I, I used to manage a guy called Derek Acora, who you may have heard wow, of. Wow, yes, I do, yeah. I was, I was his manager and I wrote his book, The Psychic World of Derek Akora, which sold... Very, very sad he died last couple of years, was it a few years back? A couple of years ago now, yeah. Um, I, I, this, is, this is a question off the top of my head. Um, it might be a bit of a strange one, but I feel like I need to ask. Have you ever got... Has uh, Derek contacted you from the spirit world? No, Derek and I were not. To actually on very good terms towards oh, the end, okay. you know. So he has he hasn't contacted me, but I I personally believe that he was on the dark side. What what does that mean? You know, he he was not an agent of the light. He wasn't an angel. Well, I believe he was working for the forces of darkness. Believe it or not, because he was very uh, materialistic. And that's why we parted company, basically, because he wasn't actually paying attention to bringing the love, hope. And the message is that there is no death. That is the message. There is only eternal life, and it's filled with love and affection. That's the message. But he was playing games about contacting the spirit of bloody, I don't know, what was it, to Dick Whittington or somebody? I don't know. It was nonsense. You know, and he was making a farce of it, which is... So he was kind of abusing his powers? He was abusing it. In the end, I believe he lost it completely. I didn't know that. Well, he wouldn't, because it's show business. And that's what he, he moved from being, working as a psychic. See, there's a difference between being a psychic and being a medium. A psychic can pick up on vibrations, and it's very limited what you can do as a psychic. But as a medium, you're communicating with the next dimension. Mm -hmm. And I believe he was mainly a psychic who was just operating in this dimension, but using the special gift that he had. You know, I've worked with many big-name psychics, and there's always one thing in common. All the psychics who are really effective – have been abused as children, beaten or and and I did some work with the, a professor at London University, and he contacted me because I was the feature editor of a newspaper for twenty seven years. The newspaper was called Psychic World, <clears throat> and uh, he asked me would I help him recruit some psychics to test. He wanted to find out what was behind psychics who were genuine. Yeah. And he, I managed to get him about half a dozen because he was working in London, so they had to be from the London area. But I put an article in the newspaper about it. And about a year later, he came back to me and said, well, I've got a conclusion here. He said, the one thing they all have in common is they are all, at some time or other, being epileptic. They've all suffered from epileptic fits. I mean, can I ask you, John, did you ever come across Colin Fry? I did, yes, and uh, I have definitely, I mean, I'm nothing against, I don't know the man, but I mean, I have nothing against him, but honestly, 
if I was to give you a psychic reading and say, ah, I've got the I've got a letter M here. Do you know anybody by the name of M? Do you know somebody whose name begins with M? Yeah. yeah. You do, yeah. Of course you do. So do I. So does everybody. It's just a nonsense. That's not how, that's not how it works. That is cold reading. That's nonsense. So I objected to the way Colin Fry worked personally. Mm. <clears throat> and can I, can I ask you, John, have you ever kind of had kind of people come to you from like bad bad characters who've passed over or you've been in prisons with for, you know, <clears throat> like... Um, <laughs> Strange Ways Sorry? is haunted. Strange Ways is very haunted. On uh, on I Wing at Strange Ways on I two landing, I was working on I Wing one day, and this inmate banging on the cell. And as I went up to his cell to find out what was wrong, uh, a, a dark shadow came out through the door and moved past past me on the landing. It's only short but big, dark shadow. And I opened the door and said, "What what's all going on here?" He said, there's a woman in my cell. I said, no, there's no women in your cell. You know, you've just been having a, a nightmare or you've fallen asleep. But, uh, and that locked, calmed him down, you know, took me about 10 minutes and locked him up. And I mentioned it to uh, the principal officer who was in charge of the, of, the, of the unit. And he said, oh, yeah, he said, she's seen quite often. It's Mrs. Merriweather. She, uh, Merrifield, she, uh, was in that cell before she was taken and hung. She was known as the Blackpool Poisoner. She I'll was, Google that now. Google it up, Mrs. Merrifield, yeah. She um, hung. Anyways, that's just yeah. one of them. So, so, John, you've got this channel. It's pretty new. Uh, you've got some impressive uh, views on your videos. I've had a look in, in such a short space of time. Um, so what's what's your plans for the future with your channel? What's the message you want to get out there? Well, basically, let people come and tell me their stories about uh, what happened to them in jail, and I'll tell people what really happened when I was a when I was a jailer and how it worked, and and numerous stories about the prisons and and the abuse. I mean, my particular view is that prison is an abuse and it's used by the government to subjugate the working class. You don't see very many middle class inmates, not very many. I met one, uh, John Stonehouse, who used to be the uh, postmaster general. He was in the cabinet of the Labour government and he set up a bank. You may remember the case. He set up a bank in London and robbed his own bank, emptied all the money out, then he left his clothes on a beach in Miami, Florida, and he was supposedly drowned, but he wasn't. He'd actually escaped to Australia with all the money. Mm. He was subsequently captured because they thought he was Lord Lucan when Lord Lucan went missing, but he wasn't. He was John Stonehouse, and he was in, in, in Wormwood Scrubs when I was there. And what a supercilious, snooty bastard he was. He, was, he had a heart attack. And uh, while he was in there, and he was put into Hammersmith Hospital, and I was his officer in charge, you know, to make sure he didn't escape. And uh, he said to me one day, he said, uh, Officer, uh, will you get my uh, Lucas aid and a copy of the Times from the canteen? I said, I think you've made a mistake here. You're the prisoner, I'm the prison officer. You stay there and get better. I'll stay here and make sure you don't escape. So that would seem to be fairly reasonable, don't you think? Seeing as I was there, he didn't escape. What do you think happened? I'll tell you what happened. He rang the, he rang the bell at the side of the bed and the, and the ward sister came up. Go and get him his, uh, uh, Lucas Aid and his copy of the Times. And I had to explain to her that this was a home office production. And I was in charge of the prisoner, and she was in charge of the hospital ward. So she should get about doing her duties, and I'll get about doing mine. Mm. You would think that she'd understand that, wouldn't you? But no. Yeah, absolutely. Um, within, within 20 minutes, somebody came from the prison and said, the chief officer wants to see you. So I was replaced. And when I got to the jail, they said, what's all this about you doing at Hammersmith Hospital? I said, the prisoner didn't escape. No. I said, well, what do you want? What do you send me there for? 
to go and fetch Lucas Heard. You can must be joking. <laughs> John, looking back on your career, do, do you regret going in the prison system? Some of the things you've seen, some of the experiences you've had, or, you know, looking back now in your twilight years and that, do you think, you know what, it was all right? Um, was it an experience or was it something you think, if you had your time again, you'd think, nah, it's not for me? Well, if I had my time again, I, I would have started writing books at an early age. Yeah. You know, but don't forget, I mean, I, I'm just from an ordinary background, you know, mm. from, the, from the army, from working in the mills, you know. And to be honest, the the, the profession of writing books is, is mainly a middle-class profession. And I was mm -hmm. definitely hard-line working class, you know. Yeah. And I didn't really have that opportunity offered to me. And I wanted to be a journalist. Eventually, right. I was a journalist. 27 years, I was the feature editor of a newspaper. I've written numerous best-selling books. Walt Disney flew me to America. I was on Amer American national TV with Walt Disney. I was published in America by Scholastic, the biggest publishers in the world. The first print run was 50,000, and that sold out instantly. I have proof that I can do it, but I didn't know at the time. So the prison service, yeah, it served its purpose, and I was able to uh, maintain my wife and family. And that's that's all I joined for. I didn't join to be a hero. I joined yeah. to be a, a working man. And I wanted to join the police, like my brother and my father, are colorblind. I failed right. the medical. I failed the medical, but you don't have to be uh, able to see colours to join the prison service. So at the time, you know, in in the in the mid seventies, a police officer was paid paid less than a prison officer. Did you know that? No, I, do. I would never have guessed that. No, you wouldn't. But it was, and it was considered mm -hmm. to be a career. You know, mm -hmm. it was. Only, it was only when I got in that I discovered the truth. Yeah. John, you talk, you, you talk about writing. What kind of things have you got in the pipeline? Or have you finished? Are you still active? Oh, absolutely. I'm writing a book uh, called Who Do You Think You Were? Which is about uh, a, a, a hypnotist who's a past life regressionist. And uh, he's in the OK magazine today, actually. Right. In, in, the, in, the, in OK magazine today. A double page feature about him called Tony Ray. I'm doing uh, a book on Tony Ray and past life regression. So I'm definitely working on that. I'm, right, I'm writing the next installment of my book, which is going to be called Strange Ways Screw, which is wow. about, about my time at Strange Ways. Because the first book I wrote about the prisons was called Psychic Screw. That, that's about when I went to Wormwood Scrubs. Mm. I had, had a lot of trouble at Wormwood Scrubs. Some people uh, tried to assault me and I hospitalised them. And uh, eventually I got transferred back to Strange Ways. And so I'm picking the story up from when I came back to Strange Ways. Right. But when you're talking about books and um, prison screws, I mean, one guy, Neil Samworth, I've, I think I've spoke to him briefly on here. Really Sam nice guy. I'm a big fan of his stuff. Uh, yeah. His book has done remarkably well. Yeah, I'm sure. So there is there is a market for it. Oh, yeah, well, um, I get often asked, why do I do some of the characters I've done? Uh, I get accused of glorifying them, which isn't the case. But listen, I'm upset. I I I'm a I could watch Adolf Hitler's body behaviour all day. It's it's a something something in the the mind psychological that. Human nature wants to understand what makes yeah. these people like that. And that's why the true crime genre is the, is the greatest selling. If you go in any Waterstones and ask them what the best seller is, is true crime. And, you know, John, I, I, I've only did it from a, from a distance, but you've actually been around it. And that's why I was so keen to talk to you today. Well, it's very nice of you to invite me. I hope you've enjoyed our little chat. No. <clears throat> well, listen, um, I'm going to put I'll put you a link for your channel. Um, so remind me what your channel's called again. Tales from the Jails. Right. And if anyone's watching this, I'm going to share it on all my platforms later. How? What's the best way to get in touch with John Sutton? Well, if you go on to Tales from the Jails, you can leave me a message there. Yeah? Yeah. 
And if you leave a message with your email address, I will get back. Right. And um, John, just all the best with your channel. If there's anything I can do, I'll give you a few shares. And anything I can help, you've got my number, mate. Just give me a give me a call. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for your time, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, God bless. Have a great day. Bye-bye.